In this video, we're going to focus on molarity and problems associated with it, such as dilution problems, conversion problems, where you have molarity, you need to find the mass in grams, the moles, the liters, things like that. And then towards the end, we're going to go over solution stoichiometry, uh, problems where you have to convert from the molarity of one substance to another, double replacement reactions, precipitation reactions, and the calculations associated with those, along with uh, limiting excess reagent problems and even percent yield questions as well. So let's begin. You need to know that molarity is one form of concentration. The molarity represented by capital M is the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. So molarity is moles over volume. Now, sometimes you may need to find the moles. The moles is equal to molarity times volume. Molarity, you can represent it as moles per liter. And if the volume is in liters, you can see how liters will cancel and you can get moles. Another equation that you need to know is the dilution equation M1V1 is equal to M2V2. The reason why this equation works is because the moles, before you add water to dilute the solution, is equal to the moles after you add water. Now granted, it has to be the moles of solute that are congruent, because as you add water, the quantity of the solution changes, but the amount of solute remains the same. If you're wondering what is the solute and what is the solvent, Think of when you dissolve salt in water. The salt is the solute, water is the solvent, but combined, they make the solution. But let's look at this problem. 80 grams of sodium hydroxide is dissolved in enough water to produce a 500 milliliter solution. What is the concentration of the solution? Let's find the concentration in molarity. Molarity is moles over liters. And I'm going to solve it using the conversion. But our goal is to get moles on top, liters on the bottom. So let's start with what we have. That's 80 grams of sodium hydroxide. To convert from grams to moles, we need the molar mass of NaOH. And based on the periodic table, the atomic mass for sodium is 23, for oxygen is 16, and for hydrogen is 1. So this gives us a total of 40 grams per mole. So what this means is that one mole of sodium hydroxide has a mass of 40 grams. The molar mass tells you the number of grams that is equivalent to one mole of substance. Now you want to set up in such a way that the unit grams cancel. So now we have moles, which is here. Molarity is moles divided by liters. So we've got to find out how many liters of solution we have. So how can we convert 500 milliliters into liters? How would you convert it? It pays to know that one liter is equivalent to 1,000 milliliters. So to convert it, you need to divide by 1,000. Or you could simply move the decimal three spaces to the left. That's equivalent to dividing it by 1,000. So 500 milliliters is the same as 0.5 liters. So let's divide the moles by the volume. So now we have moles on top, liters on the bottom, and that's going to give us the molarity of the solution. So 80 divided by 40 is 2. And 2 divided by 0.5, well, if you multiply the top and bottom by 2, this is going to be 4 over 1. So the molarity of the solution is 4 moles per liter, or simply 4m. Now granted, you could convert grams to moles, and then use the equation take moles divided by liters, but it's the same as what I have here. Let's try another problem. How many moles of sodium bromide are in 400 milliliters of a 0.3 molar solution of NABR? So this time we have molarity and volume, and we need to find moles. So we know that the moles 
is equal to the molarity multiplied by the volume. But I'm going to set it up as a conversion process. Molarity is moles of a liter, so we have 0.3 moles per one liter of solution. That's what a 0.3 mole of solution means. It's the number of moles per liter. And we have 400 milliliters, but let's convert that to liters. So we need to divide by 1,000 to do that. So 400 divided by 1,000 is the same as 0.4 liters. So we're going to put that on top. So we're going to set it up in such a way that the liters cancel, giving us moles. So it's 0.3 times 0.4. 0.3 times 0.4, if you type that in the calculator, you should get 0.12. So that's how many moles of sodium bromide that we have in a solution. This time, we need to find the mass of sodium fluoride, given the volume and the molarity. So how can we do that? In the last example, we used molarity and volume to get moles. So then we just need to use the molar mass to go from moles to grams. So the same steps that we've used in the last example, we're going to use it in this example. So let's start with molarity. We're going to write it as 0.5 moles over 1 liter of solution. Now 300 milliliters is the same as 0.3 liters if you divide 300 by 1,000. So we could see that the liters will cancel. And now we have moles of sodium fluoride. So we need to find the molar mass of NaF. The atomic mass of sodium is 23, and the atomic mass of fluorine is 19. So when added, that gives you, let's see, 23 plus 19. 9 and 3 is 12. Carry over the 1. 1 plus 2 plus 1 is 4. So it's 42. So we have 42 grams per mole. Because we have the unit moles on the top left, we need to put the unit moles on the bottom right so that they will cancel. So now we can multiply everything. 42 times 0.3 times 0.5. That's about 6.3 grams of sodium fluoride. So that's how you can calculate the mass if you're given the volume and the molarity. Calculate the volume needed to produce a 0.8 molar solution using 37 grams of calcium hydroxide. So how can we find the volume in liters or in milliliters if we have the molarity and the grams? The way you want to set it up is you want to start with mass, which is grams over 1. And then you want to use the molar mass found in the periodic table to go from grams to moles. So grams will cancel. Now, you can use molarity to go from moles to liters because molarity is moles over liters. You simply have to flip it. If you divide by molarities, the units will be liters over moles. And so moles will cancel and you have liters. And if you want to, you can convert that answer into milliliters by using the liter-milliliter conversion. So feel free to pause the video if you'd like to try the problem, or you can uh, just keep watching. So let's begin. Let's start with 37 grams of calcium hydroxide. So to convert from grams to moles, we need the molar mass. For calcium, it's roughly about 40. Now hydroxide, OH, O is 16, H is 7. So for hydroxide combined is 17, but we have two hydroxides. 17 times 2 is 34, and 40 plus 34 is 74. So there's 74 grams per one mole of substance. Now let's use the molarity to convert from moles to liters. So there's 0.8 moles per one liter of solution. So let's see what this answer is. 
in liters. So 37 divided by 74, that's 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.8. So what we have is 0.625 liters. Now if we want to, we could take it one step further and convert it all the way to liters. One liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. So we could see that the unit grams cancel, moles cancel, and liters cancel. So it's going to be 0 0.625 times a thousand. So our answer is 625 milliliters if we want it in this unit, or 0 0.625 liters. So now you know how to use molarity and grams to get the volume uh, needed. Now before we start this question, let's talk about a few things. So let's say if we have a solution and the volume of the solution, let's say it's 100 milliliters and the concentration is 1 m. And let's say the substance is sodium chloride. So what are two ways, or what is one way in which we could increase the concentration and one way that we could decrease the concentration of the solution? How can we do so? Well, if you want to increase the concentration, one way you can do that is you can add more solute. You can add more sodium chloride to the solution. The other way to increase the concentration is you can allow the solution to evaporate. So if the water leaves the solution, the volume will decrease, therefore increasing the molarity. So let's say if you don't want to change the amount of solute in the solution, you need to decrease the volume of the solution. So if you decrease the volume of the solution by a factor of two, let's say if it's now 50 milliliters instead of 100, the concentration is going to double. So it's going to be 2m instead of 1m if you reduce the volume. So anytime you decrease the volume, the molarity is going to go up, assuming you have the same amount of solute. If you add more solute, the molarity is going to go up and the volume is going to increase slightly. Now another way in which you can decrease the concentration without changing the amount of solute in the solution is by adding water. So if you add H2O, the volume of the solution will increase. So if you double the volume, the concentration will be reduced by a factor of two. So let's say the volume is now 200 milliliters. The concentration will be 0.5. So if you add water, the concentration goes down. The solution becomes diluted. If you remove water by evaporation, the solution becomes more concentrated. So make sure you understand those concepts as it relates to uh, dilution problems. Now let's work on this particular problem. So we have a 300 milliliter solution of 4M copper chloride and it's diluted to 900 milliliters which means that we're adding water to increase the volume to 900 milliliters. So the amount of solute, the copper chloride that is, is not changing. In such a situation we could use this equation M1V1 is equal to M2V2. So before we add water the molarity was 4, that's M1, the volume was 300 milliliters. Now we're looking for the new concentration after we add water and the volume has increased to 900. Now let's think about this problem conceptually before we actually use the equation. The volume increased from 300 to 900, so it increased by a factor of 3. And anytime the volume goes up, the molarity is going to go down. The solution will become diluted. It's less concentrated. So if we have a 4 molar solution, it should go down by a factor of 3. So 4 divided by 3 is simply 4 thirds, or 1.33. This should be our answer. So to solve for M2, we need to divide both sides by 900. So now we can get the answer. So we got to type this in the calculator. So 4 times 300 
divided by 900 is indeed 1.33. So that's the concentration of the new solution after we add 600 milliliters of water to increase the volume from 300 to 900. Try this problem. So what volume must a 200 milliliter solution of 0.5 M lithium chloride be diluted to in order to create a solution with a concentration of 0.10 M? So notice that we wish to decrease the concentration. Therefore, we have to increase the volume. So our goal is to calculate the final volume. So if we're decreasing the concentration by a factor of 5, we're going from 0.5 to 0.10. So if the concentration decreases by a factor of 5, the volume should increase by a factor of 5. So 200 times 5 is 1,000. So that's how you can see the answer conceptually. But let's use the equation to get the same answer. So M1V1 is equal to M2V2. So before we dilute it, the molarity is 0.5 and the volume is 200 milliliters. In this equation, the volume could be milliliters or liters. They simply have to match. If V1 is in milliliters, V2 has to be in milliliters. If V1 is in liters, V2 has to be in liters. M2 is 0.10, and so let's solve for V2. So we got to divide by 0.10. So if you type it in, 0.5 times 200 divided by 0.10, you're going to get a thousand. So we need a thousand milliliters as our final volume, which is equivalent to one liter. How many milliliters of water must be added to a hundred milliliters of a 0.8 molar solution of KOH to dilute the concentration to 0.2? So we have the molarity, the volume, another molarity and we're looking for a volume. When you see that, you know you have to use this equation. M1V1 is equal to M2V2. So the original solution has a molarity of 0.8 and the volume is 100. The new solution has a molarity of 0.2. So first we've got to find V2, the final volume. So let's divide by 0.20. So 0.8 times 100 divided by 0.20, you should get 400 milliliters as the final volume. Now keep in mind, this is not the answer. This is the volume that we need to get to. So right now, initially, we have a solution of 100 milliliters. We need to increase the volume to 400 milliliters. So how much water should we add? That's the key word here. We want to know how much water should be added. So if we have 100 and we need to get to 400, how much more do we need? We're missing 300. 100 plus 300 is 400. So to get to 400, we've got to add 300 milliliters of water. And that's the answer for this problem. So be careful with the questions where you have to find out how much water you need to add. It's the difference between the final volume and the initial volume. 400 minus 100 is 300. Consider this problem. How many milliliters of water must be removed by evaporation to increase the concentration of a 200 milliliter solution? That's also 0.25 molar. And we want to increase it to a new concentration of 1M. So this problem is similar to the last problem, but we need to find out the difference between the initial volume and the final volume. Because we're removing water, the final volume is going to be less this time. So let's use the same equation. M1V1 is equal to M2V2. So before we remove water, the molarity is 0.25 and the volume is 200. The new molarity is 1. So if the molarity goes up, the volume has to go down. So we've got to find V2. So we could ignore the 1. 1 times V2 is simply V2. So it's really 0.25 times 200. 
or 25% of 200, which is 50. So that's V2. So initially, we have a solution of, or that has a volume of 200 milliliters. And by evaporation, we want to decrease that volume to about 50 milliliters. How much water should be removed? Well, that's going to be the difference between 200 and 50, which is 150. So we need to take out 150 milliliters of water to increase the concentration from 0.25 to 1. Now, what about this problem? What volume of 0.35 M sodium hydroxide solution is required to completely neutralize 82.1 milliliters of 0.36 M solution of HCl? So how can we solve this problem? First, you need to recognize the difference between this problem and the ones we've been doing before. In the previous examples, we only had one type of solute. It could be sodium chloride, KOH, but there was no reaction. We were either adding water or removing water. In this particular problem, we do have a reaction. We have two different substances. And for these questions, you have to be careful. Now, it turns out that you can use the equation M1V1 is equal to M2V2. But you need to be careful how you use it. HCl is a monoprotic acid. It has one hydrogen per formula unit. Sodium hydroxide has one hydroxide per formula unit. Because of that, this equation is going to work the way it is. You don't have to modify it. But in other examples, let's say if you have a diprotic acid with sodium hydroxide, when you balance the reaction, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one ratio, as in the case for this reaction. And so you have to modify this equation for those situations, which we'll go over in this video. But for this particular example, if we were to write a reaction between NaOH and HCl, it's going to be a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. When NaCl combines, I mean, when this reacts, the Na and the Cl part will combine to form NaCl. H and OH will combine to form water. This is a double replacement reaction. Notice that it's already balanced, and the molar ratio between NaOH and HCl is 1. So for this example, we can just use the equation M1V1 equals M2V2. So let's say the left side is for sodium hydroxide and the right side is for HCl. So the molarity of NaOH is 0.35. We're looking for the volume for sodium hydroxide. The molarity of the HCl solution is 0.36 and the volume is 82.1. So because the V2 is in milliliters, V1 is going to be in milliliters. So let's divide both sides by 0.35. So V1 is going to be 0.36 times 82.1 divided by 0.35. And you should get 84.4 .4 milliliters. And that's the volume of sodium hydroxide that is required to completely neutralize this reaction. So that's how you can solve for the molarity or the volume for an acid-base titration problem. Simply use that equation. Now we're going to solve it another way uh, using a conversion process. For the conversion process, I would write out the balance reaction, even though we know it's one to one. So our goal is to find the liters of sodium hydroxide and then we'll get the milliliters. So since we're looking for the volume of NaOH, start with the other substance, HCl. So we have 0.36 moles of HCl per 1 liter of solution. Then we need to multiply by the volume of the solution. The volume of the HCl solution in liters is 0 0.0821 liters. Remember, to convert from milliliters to liters, divide by 1,000 or move the decimal point 
three units to the left. So the leaders cancel and we have moles of HCl. So now we need to convert from HCl to NaOH. Whenever you want to change from one substance to another substance, you need to use the molar ratio of the balanced reaction, which is one to one. So for every one mole of HCl that reacts, one mole of sodium hydroxide will react with it. So moles of HCl will cancel. Now our goal is to find the volume, and we need to use molarity to convert from moles to liters, but we have to divide by molarity. So instead of writing moles over liters, we need to write liters over moles. So we have a 0.35 molar solution of NaOH. So there's 0.35 moles of NaOH per 1 liter. And let's convert liters back into milliliters. So there's 1,000 milliliters per 1 liter. So moles of NaOH cancels, liters cancel, and we should get our answer. So 0.36 times 0 0.0821, that's 0 0.029556. Take that number divided by 0.35, and then multiply by 1,000. And you should get 84.4 milliliters, which is the answer that we had using the other method, M1V1 equals M2V2. So now you know how to solve this particular problem both ways. Now what about this problem? We have a diprotic acid instead of a monoprotic acid. 42.5 milliliters of a solution of 0.25 mKOH was required to completely titrate 47.1 milliliters of a sulfuric acid solution. Determine the unknown concentration of the H2SO4 solution. Now, let's use the equation M1V1 equals M2V2. There's a way you can get the answer without writing the balanced reaction. So here's KOH. It has one hydroxide per formula unit. And here's H2SO4, which has two hydrogen ions per formula unit. So M1V1 is going to correspond to KOH and M2V2 is going to correspond to the acid solution. Now because we have two hydrogens, put a 2 in front of M2V2. Since we have only one hydroxide, put a 1 in front of M1V1. And it's going to work. By doing this, you're incorporating the 1 to 2 molar ratio when you balance this reaction. That's how you can write the equation appropriately without actually writing out the reaction. So let's solve it. So the molarity of KOH is 0.25. The volume is 42.5. And we're looking for M2. V2 is 41.7. So let's solve for M2. Let's divide both sides by 2 times 41.7. Now, there's a mistake that I need to fix. And that mistake was a number that I plugged in. But perhaps you saw it already. I didn't catch it until now. So this is what we had before. And we said that M1 is 0.25. V1 is 42.5. M2, we're looking for that. Now V2, this is where the mistake was. I had 41.7, but it should be 47.1. It's very easy to switch two numbers. So solving for M2, it's going to be a little different. So it's going to be 0.25 times 42.5 divided by 2 and then take that result divided by 47.1 and you should get 0.113 as the molarity for the solution. Now I'm going to show you another way in which you can write the equation that we have 
using a balanced reaction. It's a little different from the way we got it. So first, let's write the reaction. KOH plus H2SO4. So it's a double replacement reaction. K is going to pair up with SO4. And whenever hydrogen pairs up with hydroxide, you're going to get water as a product. For any acid-base titration reaction, where you add a strong acid and a strong base, you always get water and a salt. Now be careful with the formula of the salt. It's not just KSO4. You have to balance the charges. K has a plus one charge. Sulfate has a negative two charge. So using this crisscross method, it's going to be K2SO4. So now let's balance the reaction. Notice that we have two hydrogen ions here. So we need two hydroxides. So it's going to be a two to one ratio. Now for every two hydroxides you have, if you react with two hydrogens, you're going to get two water molecules. Notice that the reaction is already balanced at this point. Now let me show you how to get the equation using the coefficients of the balanced reaction. And it's important to understand this method because sometimes you have to use this method as opposed to the other one. So let's give this method a name. Let's call it the coefficient method. The method that we used in the last example, let's call it the subscript method. So for the coefficient method, M1V1 is still going to apply to KOH. So I wrote it directly below KOH. And just like before, M2V2 is going to correspond to H2SO4. If you do it the other way, you will get the wrong answer. Now, for the coefficient method, the coefficient 2 is going to move to the right. So we're going to put a 2 there. And the coefficient 1 is going to move to the left. So for the coefficient method, you need to use the crisscross method to write the numbers in front of M1V1 and M2V2 so you can get the right answer. Notice that this is the same equation that we had in the last method. Now, using the subscript method, I just want to compare it right next to each other. We need to use the subscripts, the 2 and the invisible 1 for hydroxide. For the subscript method, you don't need to crisscross it, so to speak. The 1 simply goes here, and the 2 simply goes here. And you get the same equation. So for an acid-base titration, it's best to use the subscript method because you don't need to write out the reaction. But for other titrations, particularly redox titrations, you can still use this equation, but you want to use the coefficient method because the subscripts won't help you. You don't have any hydrogens or hydroxides for a redox titration, which you'll see in the next example. So you can use either of these two methods. You're going to get the same answer. So now let's get the same answer using a conversion process. So our goal is to find the molarity of H2SO4. So we need to get moles on top and liters on the bottom. Since we need to find something related to H2SO4, start with the other substance, ideally the molarity of KOH. So it's going to be 0.25 moles of KOH over 1 liter. Molarity is moles over liters. Now let's multiply by the volume of the KOH solution. 42.5 is the same as 0 0.0425 liters. You got to divide 42.5 by 1,000 to convert milliliters to liters. So liters cancel. At this point, we need to change the substance from KOH to H2SO4 using the molar ratio of the balanced reaction. And it's a 1 to 2 ratio. And that's why you got to have the 1 and 2 in front of the M1V1, M2V2 equation. You have to incorporate the molar ratio to get the right answer. Now, for every 2 moles of KOH that reacts, since there's a 2 in front of KOH, 1 mole of H2SO4 reacts with it. So the unit moles of KOH will cancel. 
So we have moles of H2SO4. To find the molarity, we need to divide the moles by the liters. So the volume of sulfuric acid is 47.1, but we need that in liters, so it's going to be 0 0.0471 if we divide it by 1,000. So now we have moles on top, liters on the bottom. We now have the molarity of the H2SO4 solution. So it's 0 0.25 times 0 0.0425 divided by 2, and then take that result divided by 0 0.0471. And you should get 0.113 m. This time we have a redox titration. So we don't have any diprotic acids where we can use the subscript method. If you're going to use M1V1 equals M2V2 for this particular problem, you have to use the coefficient method. So 37 milliliters of a 0.28 molar iron 2 chloride solution was required to completely titrate 61 milliliters of potassium permanganate. What is the concentration of the KMNO4 solution? So you need to identify the substance of interest. We need FeCl2, which is associated with the Fe plus 2 ion, and KMNO4, which is associated with permanganate. So notice that the molar ratio is 5 to 1. So M1V1 is going to correspond to the Fe plus 2, and M2V2 is going to correspond to permanganate. So the 5 is going to move here, and the 1 is going to move on this side, using the coefficient method. So now let's solve it. So the molarity for Fe is 0.28, and the volume is 37. We're looking for M2, the molarity associated with the potassium permanganate solution, and the volume is 61. So if we divide both sides by 5 times 61, we should get the answer. So M2 is going to be equal to 0.28 times 37 divided by 5 which is currently 2.072, take that result, divided by 61, and you should get 0 0.03396. This is the answer. Now let's solve it using a conversion process. Because there are some problems where you have to do a conversion, particularly the ones where you have molarity, volume, and if you got to find grams. So we're looking for the concentration of KMNO4. So let's start with the other substance, FeCl2. So it's going to be 0.28 moles of FeCl2 per liter of solution. And then let's multiply by the volume of FeCl2 in liters. So 37 milliliters is 0 0.037 liters if you divide it by 1,000. So liters cancel. Now we need to change the substance from FeCl2 to MnO4 minus. So we need to use the molar ratio, which is 5 to 1. So for every 5 moles of Fe2+, which is the same as FeCl2, 1 mole of MnO4 minus, which is the same as 1 mole of KMnO4, that's going to react with it. So these two, they cancel. And to find concentration, we simply need to divide by the liters of solution. 61 milliliters is the same as 0 0.061 liters. So we have moles on top, liters on the bottom. That's going to give us molarity. So now we just got to type it in. 0 0.28 times 0 0.037 divided by 5 divided by 0 0.061. And you get the same answer, 0 0.033967. So that is the molarity of the KMNO4 solution. Now let's go over some solution stoichiometry problems in which we can't use the M1V1 equals M2V2 equation. So if we look at this question, how many grams of zinc metal 
are required to completely react with 79.4 milliliters of a 0.375 molar HCl solution. So notice that we want to find the grams of zinc. In that case, grams is not part of the M1V1 equals M2V2 equation, so we have to use stoichiometry. So the first thing we need to do is we need to balance the reaction. So we have zinc metal plus HCl. What products will we produce in this reaction? Whenever you have a pure element and a compound, typically this is a single replacement reaction. Zinc metal is going to displace hydrogen out of the solution, and zinc is going to pair up with the chloride ion. If you look at the activity series, if you go to Google Images, you'll see that zinc is above hydrogen, which means that zinc is strong enough to displace hydrogen out of the solution. Now what is the formula when zinc and chlorine get together? Zinc typically has a plus two charge. Chloride usually has a minus one charge. So if you pair these two together using the crisscross method, it's going to be Zn1, which we don't have to write the one, Cl2. So that's going to be one of the products. And the other product will be elemental hydrogen. As a pure element, hydrogen exists as a diatomic molecule under standard conditions. Zinc is a solid. Most acids dissolve in water, so aqueous. Zinc chloride is soluble. And hydrogen is a gas. So now we need to balance the reaction. So we have two chlorine atoms on the right side. So we need to put a 2 in front of HCl. At this point, the reaction is balanced. We have two hydrogen atoms on both sides, one zinc atom and two chlorine atoms. So now we can solve for what we're looking for. So we need to find the grams of zinc. Let's start with the other substance. Let's start with the molarity of HCl. So we have a 0.375 molar solution, which means there's 0.375 moles of HCl for every one liter of solution. The volume of HCl is 0 0.0794 liters. If we divide the 79.4 milliliters by 1,000, it's going to change to liters. And so these units will cancel. So now that we have the moles of HCl, let's convert it to the moles of zinc. So we can see that the molar ratio is 1 to 2. So for every two moles of HCl that reacts, one mole of zinc reacts with it. So now at this point, we need to find the molar mass of zinc. So we got to go to the periodic table. And zinc has a molar mass of 65.39. So there's 65.39 grams of zinc for every mole of zinc. So the units moles of HCl cancels, and moles of zinc cancel as well. So this is going to give us the answer for the problem. So it's 0.375 times 0 0.0794 divided by 2 times 65.39. So the answer is 0.9735 grams of zinc. So take a minute and pause the video and try this problem. So 7.43 grams of aluminum is required to completely react with 95.4 milliliters of a copper chloride solution. What is the molarity of the CuCl2 solution? So once again, in this problem, we have grams, so we can't use M1V1 equals M2V2. So we're looking for the molarity of copper chloride. Let's start with the other substance, aluminum. But before we do that, we need to write a balanced reaction. So we have aluminum metal and CuCl2. So we have a pure element plus a compound. So this is another single replacement reaction. Aluminum is going to displace copper out of the solution, and aluminum is going to pair up with the chloride ion. Now, in the activity series, aluminum is way above copper, so this reaction will proceed to the right. It's going to work. Aluminum is in group 3A of the periodic table, so it has a plus 3 charge. Chloride is a halogen, 
which typically has a negative one charge. So using the crisscross method, when these two get together, they're going to form a compound known as aluminum chloride, AlCl3. And copper is going to be displaced out of the solution as copper metal, which is simply Cu. So now let's balance the reaction. Notice that we have three chlorine atoms on the right, but two on the left. What is the least common multiple of two and three? One way to find out is to multiply two and three. Two times three is six. So we need six chlorine atoms on both sides. So six divided by two is three. Let's put a three in front of copper chloride. Six divided by three is two. Let's put a two in front of AlCl3. So notice that we have six chlorine atoms on both sides. Now we have three copper atoms on the left. So let's put a three in front of Cu. And we have two aluminum atoms on the right. So let's put a two in front of Al. So now the reaction is balanced. So now we can answer the question. We're looking for the molarity of copper chloride. So let's start with the other substance, aluminum. So we have 7.43 grams of aluminum. And let's convert it to moles. So the molar mass for aluminum is about 26.98 grams per one mole. So now we can change the substance using the molar ratio. So the molar ratio between aluminum and copper chloride is 2 and 3. So for every 2 moles of aluminum that reacts, 3 moles of copper chloride reacts with it. So these units cancel. Now our goal is to find the molarity. If you want to find the molarity, it's going to be moles divided by liters. So we need to put liters on the bottom in the next part. So the volume of copper chloride is 95.4, which is 0 0.0954 liters. And now we have the molarity, moles over liters. So the answer is going to be 7.43 divided by 26.98 times 3 divided by 2 and then take that result divided by 0 0.0954 you should get 4.33 m for the molarity of copper chloride here's another problem what volume of a 0.35 molar NaCl solution is required to completely react with 39 milliliters of lead nitrate. So let's write the reaction. So we have a compound plus another compound. Typically this is a double replacement reaction. So sodium is going to pair up with nitrate. Sodium has a plus one charge, nitrate has a minus one charge. So whenever the charges are the same, we could simply pair up the two in a one to one ratio. Now for lead and chlorine, we can't do that. Lead has a plus two charge, and chlorine has a minus one charge. So using the crisscross method, it's going to be PB1Cl2, which we can write it as PBCl2. So now let's go ahead and balance the reaction. So we have two nitrates on the left side. We need to put a two in front of NaNO3. So we need a two in front of NaCl. And everything else is balanced at this point. Now, sodium chloride is soluble. All of the alkali metals like sodium, lithium, potassium, they're always soluble. So we're going to write aqueous. Nitrates are always soluble. However, Lead chloride is insoluble. Chlorides are usually soluble except with silver, lead, and mercury. So this is a solid. Whenever you mix two aqueous solutions, and if you get a solid product, this is also known as a precipitation reaction. Now, our goal is to find the volume of NaCl. So let's start with the other substance, lead nitrate. So we have 0.15 moles of PbNO3 2 per 1 liter. 
and the volume of lead nitrate is 39 milliliters or 0 0.039 liters. So the liters cancel. Now we need to change the substance. So we have to use the molar ratio. It's 1 to 2. So for every 1 mole of PbNO3-2 that reacts, 2 moles of NaCl reacts with it. And so now these units cancel. Now our goal is to find volume. So we need to use molarity to convert from moles to liters. So you got to divide by molarity. So it's 0.35 moles of NaCl on the bottom, based on this number, and one liter on the top. But let's convert it to milliliters. There's a thousand milliliters per one liter. So moles of NaCl cancel, and moles and liters cancel as well. So now we can get the final answer. So it's going to be 0.15 times 0.039 times 2 divided by 0.35 and then times a thousand. So the answer is 33.4 milliliters of NaCl. That's the volume of NaCl that's required to completely react with all of the lead nitrate that is in a solution. So now you know how to do solution stoichiometry, not to find the grams, the volume, and the molarity if needed. 31 milliliters of a 0.25 molar NABR solution reacts with excess Cl2 gas. After the reaction was completed, 0.481 grams of Br2 was collected. What is the percent yield? To find the percent yield, it is equal to the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. The actual yield is typically given in the reaction, and it's associated with the amount of product that was collected. So the actual yield is the 0.481 grams. So we've got to find the theoretical yield. Now, if the actual yield is associated with Br2 and it's in grams, the theoretical yield must also be associated with the grams Br2. So let's use stoichiometry to calculate the maximum amount of Br2 that can be collected in this reaction. The maximum amount represents the theoretical yield. So first, we need to write a balanced reaction. So we have chlorine gas reacting with sodium bromide. So we have a pure element and a compound. So this is a single replacement reaction. In the other single replacement reactions, typically a metal like aluminum would displace another metal like copper out of the solution. Or, in a rare case, a nonmetal like hydrogen out of the solution. Now hydrogen, even though it's a nonmetal, it's similar to metals in the sense that hydrogen forms plus one charges. Metals, they like to form positive charges. Most other nonmetals like to form negative charges. So chlorine, a nonmetal, is going to replace or displace bromine, another nonmetal, out of the solution. Both bromine and chlorine like to form negative charges. So when chlorine kicks out bromine, chlorine is going to pair up with sodium. Sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a minus one charge. Because the magnitude of the charges are the same, these two are going to get together in a one-to-one -one ratio. And elemental bromine is going to be displaced out of the solution. Bromine is a red liquid, chlorine is a gas. And sodium bromide and sodium chloride are aqueous in the solution. They're very soluble. Anytime you have an alkali metal like lithium, sodium, or potassium, it's always soluble in water. So now we got a balanced reaction. We have two chlorine atoms on the left side, so we got to put a 2 in front of NaCl. We have two bromine atoms on the right, so we need a 2 in front of NaBr. And now the reaction is balanced. So let's calculate the theoretical yield of bromine in grams. So chlorine is the excess reactant, so we don't have to worry about it, which means that sodium bromide is the limiting reactant. So let's start with that. So we have 0.25 moles of NaBr per one liter of solution. And the volume of NaBr is 0 0.031 liters. So 
So now let's convert the substance from sodium bromide to bromine. So the molar ratio is 2 to 1. So for every 2 moles of sodium bromide that reacts, 1 mole of Br2 will be produced. So these units cancel. Now the last thing we need to do to get the theoretical yield is to convert moles to grams. The molar mass of atomic Br is 79.9. So if we multiply that by 2, the molar mass of Br2 is 159.8 grams per 1 mole. So those units cancel. And so the answer is going to be 0.25 times 0 0.031 divided by 2 times 159.8. So the theoretical yield of bromine is 0.619 grams of Br2. Now it's important to understand what this number means. This number means that if all of the sodium bromide in a solution reacts, all of it, this is the maximum amount of bromine that can be produced in a reaction. That's what the theoretical yield is. It's the, the most you can get out of a reaction. Now we didn't get that much. We got less. In this experiment we only got 0.481. So now we can calculate the theoretical yield. I mean the percent yield. So the percent yield is going to be equal to the actual yield of 0.481 divided by the theoretical yield of 0.619 times 100%. So you should get 77.7%. So that is the percent yield of this particular reaction. Ten grams of aluminum is placed in a 450 milliliter solution of a 1.35 molar H2SO4 solution. What is the theoretical yield of hydrogen gas produced in grams? And how much excess reactant is left over? Now the first thing that we need to do is we need to write a balanced reaction. So we have aluminum metal reacting with sulfuric acid. So we have a pure element mixed with a compound. And we know that hydrogen gas is going to be produced. A pure element and a compound is going to give you a single replacement reaction. So aluminum is going to displace hydrogen out of the solution, and then aluminum is going to pair up with sulfate. As an ion, we know that aluminum has a plus 3 charge, and sulfate has a minus 2 charge. So to write the formula when aluminum combines with sulfate, it's going to be Al2SO43. Whenever you have multiple polyatomic ions, you need to enclose it in parentheses. So this is what we now have. So now we need to balance the reaction. Notice that we have three sulfates on the right side. So that tells us that we need to put a 3 in front of H2SO4. Now we have six hydrogen atoms and 2 on this side. 6 divided by 2 is 3, so we need a 3 in front of H2. And we have two aluminum atoms on the right, so we need a 2 in front of Al, and a 1 here. And now the reaction is balanced. So now, how can we find the theoretical yield of hydrogen gas? We have the mass of aluminum, since it's a solid, and sulfuric acid is usually dissolved in water, so it's a solution. So we have the volume and the molarity of this solution. So we're given the information for both reactants. So whenever you have a situation like this, you need to identify which one is the limiting reactant and which one is the excess reactant. Now there's different ways you can go about doing that. One method is you can find the moles of each reactant and divide it by their respective coefficient. So let's say if you have two moles of aluminum and two moles of sulfuric acid, for instance. For aluminum, you would divide it by two, that's the coefficient that corresponds to it. And for sulfuric acid, we need to divide it by the coefficient of three. So two over two is one, and two over three is 0 
So in this example, because sulfuric acid has the lower mole per coefficient ratio, it's going to be the limiting reactant. However, it's going to take time to convert the grams to moles, and for sulfuric acid, we need to convert the molarity and the milliliters into moles. That's going to take time. But you could do it that way if you want to. Another way in which you can do it is you can take the 10 grams of aluminum and convert it to the grams of hydrogen gas, and then take the molarity and volume of sulfuric acid and convert it to the grams of hydrogen gas separately. Whichever one gives you the smaller amount of product, that is the correct theoretical yield. And at the same time, you know which one is going to be the limiting reactant. The reactant that gives you the lower theoretical yield is the limiting reactant. So by doing it that way, you can find the theoretical yield and identify the limiting and the excess reactant at the same time. So I'm going to do it that way. I believe it's more efficient. So let's start with 10 grams of aluminum. You can try this too. Go ahead and convert it to the grams of hydrogen. So we need to do a gram to gram conversion. So we need to convert the grams of aluminum into moles of aluminum using the molar mass. And then we need to use the molar ratio to convert the moles of aluminum to the moles of hydrogen. And then using the molar mass of hydrogen, we can go from the moles of hydrogen to the grams of hydrogen. So the molar mass for aluminum is 26.98 grams per one mole. So the grams of Al will cancel. Now we need to use the molar ratio between aluminum and hydrogen. So it's a 2 to 3 ratio. So for every 3 moles of hydrogen gas that's produced, 2 moles of aluminum reacts. And so these units cancel. And now we need to convert from moles to grams. The atomic mass of a single hydrogen atom is about 1. So for a hydrogen molecule which has 2 hydrogen atoms, the molar mass is 2. So it's 2 grams of hydrogen for every 1 mole of the diatomic molecule. So now let's get the answer. 10 divided by 26.98 times 3 divided by 2 and times 2. So the molar mass, I mean not the molar mass, but the grams of hydrogen is going to be 1.111 grams. So if all of the 10 grams of aluminum reacts, the maximum amount of hydrogen that we can get from it is 1.11, well the last number should be 2, 1.112 grams of hydrogen. So I'm going to place this number right below aluminum so we know that this is the grams of hydrogen that can be produced if all of the aluminum reacts. Now let's start with sulfuric acid. Let's convert it to the grams of H2. So let's start with the molarity. So there's 1.35 moles of H2SO4 per 1 liter. And we have 0.45 liters of H2SO4. So these units cancel. And now we need to change the substance. We need to go from H2SO4 to H2. So the molar ratio is 3 to 3. So for every 3 moles of H2 that is produced in a reaction, 3 moles of sulfuric acid is consumed in a reaction. And our last step is to convert from moles to grams. And we already know that the molar mass is 2 grams per mole for H2. So moles of H2SO4 cancels, and the moles of H2 will cancel as well. So the answer is going to be 1.35 times 0.45, and 3 over 3 cancels, so we could ignore that, and then times 2. So you should get 1.215 grams of H2. So if all of the sulfuric acid reacts, the maximum amount of grams of hydrogen that can be produced from it is 1.215 grams. 
So which one is the correct theoretical yield of H2? Is it 1.1 or 1.2? By the time we get 1.1 grams of hydrogen, all of the aluminum has been reacted. So if there's no more aluminum to react with, the reaction stops. So the correct theoretical yield is the smaller of the two values. Now that we have the correct theoretical yield, the reactant that gives you the correct theoretical yield of the smaller amount of product, that is the limiting reactant. So aluminum is the limiting reactant. It gave us a smaller amount of grams of H2. And sulfuric acid is the excess reactant. Now that we know that, how can we figure out the amount of excess reactant that is left over? So because the excess reactant is a solution, we want to find the volume of H2SO4 that remains. How can we do that? To understand the idea of finding the amount of excess reactant that remains, you need to know how much there was before the reaction, that's the total amount, minus the amount that was actually consumed in the reaction or the amount that reacts. And that difference is going to be the amount that's left over. So for example, let's say if you have 100 milliliters of solution, and out of that, only 70 milliliters of solution reacts, then the amount that's left over is 30 milliliters. We already have the total volume, that's 450 milliliters of solution. We need to find out what volume of H2SO4 reacts in a solution. And then we could find out how much is left over. To find out how much H2SO4 reacts in a solution, start with the limiting reactant and convert to the excess reactant. That's what you need to do. So we need to start with the grams of aluminum. That's the 10 grams. And we need to convert it to the liters of H2SO4. But we'll use milliliters for now. We'll convert it to ml. So let's start with 10 grams of aluminum. Now let's convert it to moles using the molar mass. The molar mass is 26.98 per one mole. So now at this point, we need to convert the substance from Al to H2SO4. And we could see that the molar ratio is 2 to 3. So for every 2 moles of aluminum that reacts, 3 moles of H2SO4 reacts with it. So now let's convert to liters. So let's use the molarity to do that. The molarity of H2SO4 is 1.35. So that means that there's 1.35 moles per 1 liter. And we can convert to milliliters by this ratio. There's 1,000 milliliters per 1 liter. So moles of aluminum cancels, moles of H2SO4 cancels as well, and liters cancel. So now we can see the volume of H2SO4 that reacts. So it's 10 divided by 26.98 times 3 divided by 2 times 1,000 divided by 1 1.35. And you should get about 411.83. So that's how much H2SO4 that reacts in the solution. And now that we have that, we could find out how much is left over. So we had a total of 450 and 411.83 reacts. So the amount that's left over is about 38.17 milliliters. Now sometimes the question may ask you how much is left over in moles or in grams. As long as you get one of the answers that is left over, you can convert you can convert it to a different unit. For example, we have the volume that's left over. We can use that to convert it to the moles that's left over or the grams. So we have the molarity of the solution, which is pretty constant. Let's start with that, 1.35 moles per liter. 
and the volume that's left over in liters is 0 0.03817. So if we multiply m times n, I mean m times v, molarity times volume, that's going to give us moles. 1.35 times 0 0.03817. This is how much moles that is left over from the reaction. That's 0 0.0515 moles. Now, if we want to find the grams that's left over, convert the moles that's left over into grams. So we need the molar mass of H2SO4. We have two hydrogens plus sulfur, which is about 32, plus four oxygens, that's four times 16. So you get a total of 98. So the molar mass of H2SO4 is 98 grams per one mole. So if you multiply 98 by the point 0 0.0515, the mass that remains is about 5.05 grams of H2SO4. So now you know how to find the amount of excess reactant that is left over for a solution in uh, volume, and you know how to get the grams, and in moles. You just have to be good with conversions. If you can master the process, of converting units, you can answer any question that is thrown at you on a test. So here's another problem similar to the last one. Feel free to pause the video and see if you can get the answer. So we have silver nitrate, AgNO3, it's mixed with calcium chloride, and here we have a compound mixed with a compound, so this is a double replacement reaction. So let's go ahead and predict the products and balance the equation. So we know that AG is going to pair up with CL. AG has a plus one charge, CL has a minus one charge. So the magnitude of the charges are the same, so we can simply combine them in a one-to-one -one ratio. Now we need to combine calcium with nitrate. Calcium is a group two alkaline earth metal, so it has a plus two charge. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion with a minus one charge. So we can see that when these two combine, we're going to get CaNO3 2. So now that we have the products of the reaction, let's go ahead and balance the reaction. So we have two nitrates on the right side, so we need to put a 2 in front of AgNO3. We have two chlorine atoms on the left, so we need a 2 in front of AgCl. And now the reaction is balanced. We have one calcium atom on both sides. So now we could figure out the answer to this problem. Our goal is to find the number of grams of AgCl that can be produced. By the way, this is a precipitation reaction. AgCl is a solid. Everything else is in the aqueous phase. Nitrates are always soluble and chlorides are usually soluble except with silver, lead, and mercury. So we got to find the grams of product, which is basically the theoretical yield. We're given the information of both reactants. So we don't know which one is the limiting reactant at this point, but just like before, we're going to take each reactant and find out how many grams of product can be produced from it. Whichever number gives us the lower theoretical yield or the smaller grams of product, that's going to be the theoretical yield and the reactant that gave us that answer is the limiting reactant. So let's start with uh, silver nitrate. Let's start with the molarity. So we have 0.19 moles of AgNO3 per liter multiplied by the volume of AgNO3 which is 0 0.025 liters. So these units cancel. And now we need to use the molar ratio. So we can see that it's a 2 to 2 ratio between AgNO3 and AgCl. So for every 2 moles of AgCl that's produced, 2 moles of AgNO3 reacts. So now we need to find the molar mass of AgCl. The molar mass of Ag is 107.9 plus Cl, which is 35.45. So the molar mass is 143.35 grams 
per one mole. So 0.19 times 0 0.025. The 2 over 2 will cancel, so we could ignore that, times 143.35. You should get 0 0.681. So I'm going to put this number right below AgNO3. So this will produce 0 0.681 grams of AgCl. So now let's start with the other substance, calcium chloride. So we have 0.15 moles of CaCl2 per liter times 0 0.031 liters. And the molar ratio between AgCl and CaCl2, it's 1 to 2. So for every 1 mole of calcium chloride that is consumed in a reaction, two moles of HCl are produced. And the molar mass is the same. It's 143.35. So these units cancel, and the same is true for that. So it's 0.15 times 0 0.031 times 2 times 143.35. So calcium chloride can produce up to 1.333 grams of AgCl. So clearly that is not the theoretical yield. The maximum amount of AgCl that we can get in this reaction is the smaller of the two values. So that's going to be the 0.681 grams, which means that AgNO3 is the limiting reactant because it gives us the smaller theoretical yield and calcium chloride is the excess reactant. Now let's calculate the amount of grams of excess reactant that remains. But let's find the volume first. So the excess reactant is calcium chloride. The total volume of calcium chloride before the reaction is 31. Let's find the volume of calcium chloride that actually participates or that's actually consumed in the reaction. So start from the limiting reactant and convert it to the excess reactant. So let's start with AgNO3, which is 0.19 moles per liter. And let's multiply by the volume, which is 0 0.025 liters. And the molar ratio between the limiting reactant and the excess reactant, it's 2 to 1. So you always need the molar ratio whenever you want to convert from one substance to another substance. So for every two moles of AgNO3 that's consumed in a reaction, one mole of calcium chloride will also be consumed. So these units cancel, and liters cancel as well. So now our goal is to find the volume. So to go from moles to liters, we need to use the molarity and that is the molarity of calcium chloride, which is 0.15. So there's 0.15 moles of calcium chloride per one liter of solution. And let's convert liters into milliliters. So there's 1,000 milliliters per liter. So these units cancel, liters cancel. And so we have 0.19 times 0 0.025 divided by 2. Take that result, divided by 0.15, and then times it by 1,000. So you should have 15.83 milliliters of calcium chloride. That's how much is consumed in a reaction. So now let's find out how much is left over. So we have a total of 31 milliliters minus 15.83 that reacts in the solution. So the amount that's left over is the difference, which is about 15.17 milliliters. That's the volume of the excess reactant that remains. Now using that, we can find the grams of the excess reactant that remains. So let's start with the molarity of calcium chloride. So we have 0.15 moles per liter. Let's multiply by the volume that remains in liters, which is 0.01517. It's basically this number in liters. And then let's convert moles to grams. So we need the molar mass of calcium chloride. Calcium is about 40, 
CL is 35.45, but you got to multiply that by 2. So you should get 110.9 grams per 1 mole. So it's 0.15 times 0 0.01517 times 110.9. And the grams of excess reactant that remains is 0.252 grams of calcium chloride. Two hundred milliliters of a five molar sodium chloride solution is mixed with six hundred milliliters of a one molar sodium chloride solution. What is the molarity of the mixture? So here we have the same substance, so there's no reaction that's occurring. We don't have to write a single or double replacement reaction. But how can we find the molarity of the combined mixture? Let's say if the first solution has two moles, and if the second solution has three moles then the combined solution should have 5 moles of sodium chloride. Now keep in mind, the moles is equal to M1V1, or molarity times volume. So M1V1, which represents the moles of sodium chloride in the first solution, plus M2V2, which represents the moles of sodium chloride in the second solution, should equal M3V3, which represents the total moles of sodium chloride in the combined solution. If you add 2 and 3 moles together, you should get 5. So we're using the dilution equation, but in its expanded form. So that's how you can apply it for mixture problems. So let's find what the answer is. But before we do that, before we calculate it, let's see if we can ballpark the answer. If you mix a concentrated solution with a dilute solution, the mixture should be somewhere in between. So it should be somewhere between 5 and 1. It has to be greater than 1 but less than 5. Between 1 and 5, the midpoint is 3. Now, do you think the answer is between 1 to 3 or 3 to 5? Notice that we have more of the dilute solution. If we had an equal amount of the 5 molar solution and the 1 molar solution, the mixture should be right in the middle, 3. This problem is basically a weighted average. But since we have more of the 1 molar solution, the mixture or the weighted average should be somewhere between 1 and 3. It could be like 2, it could be 2.5, 1.8, but it's somewhere between 1 and 3. So let's actually, let's calculate the answer using the equation. So the first solution has a molarity of 5 and a volume of 200. The second solution has a molarity of 1, but a volume of 600. And we're looking for the molarity of the third solution. Now, what is V3? V3 is the total volume. If you mix 200 milliliters with 600 milliliters, the solution will now contain 800 milliliters. Notice that we can simplify the calculation if we divide every term by 100. So we can cancel the zeros. 200 divided by 100 is 2, and 5 times 2 is 10. 600 divided by 100 is 6. So this is simply 6. And 800 divided by 100 is simply 8. So we have M3 times 8. 10 plus 6 is 16. And so if we divide both sides by 8, 16 divided by 8 is 2. So the molarity of the new solution is 2m. It's between 1 and 5, but it's less than 3 because we have more of the dilute solution. Seven hundred milliliters of a two molar NaCl solution is mixed with six hundred milliliters of a three molar sodium sulfate solution and five hundred milliliters of a four molar sodium phosphate solution. What is the molarity of the sodium ion in the combined reaction? If we mix these three substances, they're not going to react with each other. And sodium is a spectrum ion, so it's not going to be consumed in the reaction. So to find the molarity of the sodium ion, we simply need to find the total moles of the sodium ion divided by the total liters. We're going to solve it using two methods. 
The second method would be using the M1V1 equations. So let's find the moles of NaCl in each solution. So for the first one, for NaCl, I meant to say we want to find the moles of Na plus in each solution. For the first one, we have 2 moles per liter times 0.7 liters, which is 700 milliliters. So 2 times 0.7, that's about 1.4 moles of Na plus. Notice that we have 1 Na in that formula unit. Now for the second one, it's a little different. We have 3 moles, the molarity is 3, so we have 3 moles of sodium sulfate per liter of solution, and the volume is 600 milliliters, which is 0.6 liters, so liters cancel. But notice that there's 2 sodium ions in that formula unit. So there's 2 moles of Na plus for every one mole of sodium sulfate. So these units cancel. And so it's going to be 3 times 0.6 but multiplied by 2, which is 3.6 moles of Na+. For the third solution, we have a molarity of 4. So there's 4 moles of Na3PO4 per liter times the volume of 0.5 liters, so liters cancel, and there's 3 moles of Na+, plus, since the subscript is 3, there's 3 moles of Na+, plus per 1 mole of sodium phosphate. So this is going to be 4 times 0.5 times 3 which gives us 6 moles of Na+. So now we could find the molarity of Na+, which I'm going to put it in brackets. So the concentration of the sodium ion is the total moles, which is 1.4 plus 3.6. That gives you 5 plus 6, that's 11. So we have a total of 11 moles of sodium ions divided by the total volume of the solution, which is 700 plus 600 plus 500. 700 plus 600 is 1300 plus 500, that's 1800. 1800 milliliters, if you divide it by 1000, is 1 1.8 liters. To find the molarity, the volume has to be in liters, not milliliters. So 11 divided by 1.8, the molarity, is 6.1 m Na+. Plus. Now you might be wondering, hey, this number is greater than 4. And the reason why is because there's a 3 in front. So in that 4 molar sodium phosphate solution, you need to realize that there's 12, it's 12 molar Na+, plus if you do 4 times 3. So for this one, the concentration of Na+, plus in this solution is 2. For this one, it's 3 times 2 is 6. And for this one, it's 4 times 3, which is 12. And so the Na plus concentration is between the lowest number and the highest number, between 2 and 12, which is 6, which makes sense. Now, there's another way in which we can get the same answer. Now, in the last example, we were mixing two solutions. So we had M1V1 and M2V2 on the left side of the equation, and the M3V3 represent the combined mixture. This time, we're mixing three solutions. So we should have three things on the left side of the equation. So it's going to be M1V1 plus M2V2 plus M3V3. That's for the three solutions. And then M4V4 for the combined mixture. Now it makes sense though, because this represents the, the moles of Na plus in the first solution. This is the moles for the second solution. And that's the moles for the third solution. In the last example, or the other method that we use, we added the moles in each solution and divided by the total volume, which is V4. And that gave us M4. So this equation simply helps you to do the same work, but it just appears to be easier. But the work is still the same.
Now, you do need to incorporate the coefficient, not the coefficient, but the subscript of Na into this equation. So for sodium chloride, the subscript is 1. So let's put a 1 in front of M1V1. Now for sodium sulfate, the subscript is 2 because there's two sodium ions there. So we've got to put a 2 in front of M2V2. And for sodium phosphate, we have a 3 in front of it. So let's put the 3 in front. If you do that, then you'll get the right answer. So now let's find the concentration of Na+. So the molarity of the first solution is 2, and the volume is 700. And then plus 2 times the molarity of the second solution, which is 3, and the volume is 600. And then plus 3 times the molarity of the third solution, which is 4, times the volume of 500. And we're looking for M4. The total volume, 700 plus 600 plus 500, we said it's 1,800 milliliters. Now, in this equation, we don't need to change it to liters because V1, V2, V3 is already in milliliters. So V4 has to be in milliliters. It has to match. So we're going to put 1,800 on this side. To simplify the math, just like before, let's divide by 100 to every term. So 700 divided by 100 is 7. The zeros cancel, and what's left over is 2 times 17, which is 14. 600 divided by 100 is 6. So 2 times 3 is 6, times the other 6, that's 36. 500 divided by 100 is 5. 5 times 4 is 20. 20 times 3 is 60. And 1,800 divided by 100 is 18. 14 and 36 is 50. 50 plus 60 is 110. So it's 110 over 18. That's equal to M4. And you're going to get the same answer, 6.1 M. That is the concentration of the Na plus ion. So that is it for this video. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.